Again, this series concerns itself uh, with uh, personalities of 19th century Europe uh, whose influence, and we can say who, the problems that they faced, are here with us almost 200 years later. And uh, because of that, uh, what they went through uh, can be of some aid to us in our attempts to understand our own current situation. Last week I spoke about the Rishon Rebbe, the Israel Friedman. Uh, that was the Hasidic side of the coin. Uh, tonight uh, the subject is Rabbi Yosef Dov Alevi Salavechik, the Beis Alevi, which is the Lithuanian side of the coin. Now, uh, Rabbi Salavechik had an extremely difficult life, a life suffused with disappointments and tragedies. But in his life, uh, and in the events that occurred to him, we have a picture of what uh, the 1800s looked like in Lithuania. And the picture is not the picture that is always portrayed, uh, the fantasy picture of Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is going downhill at a tremendous rate in the 19th century both in terms of religious observance and in terms of the Jewish community generally. And there are many reasons for it, as we will see, hopefully, in the next uh, 60 minutes here, uh, in this idea about Rabbi Soloveitchik. Rabbi Soloveitchik was a direct descendant through his mother, of uh, Reb Chaim Valozhiner, the great Reb Chaim Rabinowitz, the Rav in uh, the Rosh Yeshiva, the man who founded the Valozhiner Yeshiva, and the man that was the uh, disciple of the Gaon of Vilna. And he was a person that uh, took the initiative to try and save Lithuanian Jewry and his initiative was to create this great yeshiva, the yeshiva in Valozhin, the yeshiva Seitz Chaim in Valozhin, which for uh, 89 years uh, was the main yeshiva in Lithuania, the father and mother of all the other yeshivot, and which produced the men who were the leaders of Torah uh, for the next number of generations. Uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, is orphaned at a very young age from both his father and mother when he's nine years old. And he came to live by relatives of his mother who uh, did not treat him nicely, to put it mildly, who abused him. He was a very mischievous child. He was thrown out of every Talmud Torah that he was in, every cheder. And uh, that's usually a sign of genius. <laughs> Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky told me once uh, when I was consulting with him about a student in my yeshiva that, uh, you know, he had his own his own rules, his own school. But he was an outstanding, outstanding student, and he had a great personality. And I felt something would be of him, that would become of him, and something has become of him. He's an outstanding rov in America. But he was a terror to have in the classroom. I mean, all the teachers, nobody wanted him. So I came to Rabbi Yaakov and I said, what should I do? Should I send him out? So he told me, he said, I just want to tell you a story. He said, you know, Reb Chaim Ezer Grajensky, the great Reb Chaim Ezer, uh, the Rav of Vilna, uh, who carried the Jewish people on his back, literally, uh, <clears throat> until his death in 1940. 
So he said when he was 12 years old, he rode a goat into the classroom by the Malamed. And the Malamed threw him out. So he says, but from riding the goat into the classroom, because that, you know, he had that in him. So uh, it needs a lot of patience. I don't advocate anybody riding a goat into a classroom. But on the other hand, uh, you have to be careful. So he was a very wild, mischievous child. And he's an orphan. And uh, he has this brilliant mind. Brilliant mind. But he, uh, he likes games, plays, uh, wastes his time with the other boys. And he's such a, a charismatic, magnetic figure uh, that uh, everybody's afraid that he's going to ruin his child. And therefore, the parents don't want that their children should play with him or should have anything to do with him. He, uh, his father, his grandfather, they were very important people originally in Brisk, which we're going to talk about. Brisk is Brest Litovsk. And they, then they moved to Kovna. He had no official position, but he was a well-known scholar and a well-known person in the community. I don't know what to do with him. He's 13 years old, just becomes bar mitzvah. So they know that they have protection in Valozhin because he is a direct descendant of the Reb Chaim Valozhin. So they bring him into the yeshiva. The head of the yeshiva then is Reb Yitzchok Balozhener, Reb Chaim's son, who is like a great uncle to him. And uh, they take him into the yeshiva. And because of his genius and his mind, all of a sudden he decides that he's going to sit down and learn. And he becomes a famous ilui, a genius in the yeshiva when he's 13, 14, 15. To the extent that no one, uh, uh, no one can, can almost compare to him, even though in Valozhin there are giants. Now, Valozhin was a place, uh, Beis Harav it was called. It was a dynasty. The dynasty was from Reb Chaim Valozhiner. And because of his children and grandchildren and the extended family in the Mechutonim, there were a lot of people who felt that they should have a piece of the yeshiva. And this will go on for the entire 89 years of the yeshiva. The dynastic uh, court fights that happen in nobility, Lahavdal happen here. And because of that, uh, aside from the greatness in learning and everything else, there always is an undercurrent, an undertow of tension. He uh, has cousins, second cousins, third cousins in the yeshiva. He's way above them. He's the ilui. They were jealous of him. Simply put, and they were jealous of the fact that uh, Rebitzela, the Rosh Yeshiva, seemed to favor him over the other relatives in the Beis Arav. And they were simply uh, jealous of his, uh, of his mind. Now, he also did not, he was in Valozhin, but he didn't follow the rules of Valozhin. Because that he, all of his life, he doesn't follow rules. He follows the Torah. But he doesn't follow man-made rules. That's not him. We'll see that when he comes a rov, it's just uh, fire and gasoline all the time. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't care, you know, the board of directors, the president, the, the, the balabat. You know, I'm worthless to him. So here, he doesn't follow the rules. He uh, doesn't learn in the base medrash of the yeshiva. 
He's got a little base medrash somewhere in one of the little synagogues in town, and he learns there. Uh, he doesn't come to the minion. He's got his own minion that he goes to, or he doesn't go to. Uh, he has his own hours. So those who uh, didn't like him uh, used all of this against him. And they came and reported it to the heads of the yeshiva. And they said, you know, he never he doesn't, he doesn't keep the, the story, he doesn't keep the regular schedules, he doesn't daven with, with us, he doesn't come to our base medrash, we don't know what he's doing. Now he was well known, well known for his charity. He was a, a, an unbelievable person of charity all of his life. And he also always was on the side of the poor and the underdog. In a Jewish society, and I mentioned it last week, in a Jewish society where 95% of the people were below the poverty line, and then you had like 3% of the people that were uh, the Klei Kodesh, the rabbis, the Malamdim, etc. And then you had maybe 2% of the people that were the wealthy class. And the, this 5% ruled the 95%. And ruled is a mild word. They oppressed them. The only word. As we'll see in a few incidents. He always took for, he always was with the 95%. He took the, the it, all of his friends in, were from the poor students that came that didn't have any money. Uh, he had nothing to do with his uh, aristocratic cousins. He plays with the shoemaker's son. So once it happened, that uh, a poor boy was walking in the streets of Alojin and he was wearing the overcoat of Rabbi Yoshebeer with the boots. And everybody knew this poor boy didn't own an overcoat and didn't have any boots. So they said to him, where did you get it? Where did you get the coat and the boots? She said, I got it from uh, Yoshebeer Salavechik. That's where I got it. So they said, no, you stole it. Why would he give you away his overcoat and his boots? He gave away the overcoat and boots because the boy had to go outside. He had a bad cold. He was afraid that he would get sick if walking around in the winter in Valozhin without a coat and boots. So he gave him his coat and boots. So when the cousins came to check up as to whether or not this story was true, so Rabbi Shaber in his mischievous way said, listen, he said, in a game of cards, lots of things can happen. <laughs> Giving the impression that he was playing cards with him and he lost it. Uh, he lost his boots and his, well, playing cards. So they ran away, to, right away to the heads of the yeshiva, etc. And uh, they were going to throw him out. And he refused to give his excuses. He always was, uh, you know, he didn't, he, the, in the Torah it says, Lo sagura mipnaish. You shall not be afraid of any human being. Don't give way. He never gave way to human beings. He told his uncle, he said, you don't want me in the yeshiva? Tell me, we'll go. But he said, you have no one to replace me with. I mean, that's a, that's a trait within the Soloveitchiks, is that they, on one hand, they are very charitable and humble people. On the other hand, they're very strong people. They don't give any quarter. There's a story told about uh, Rabbi Yoshebeer's son, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik, that when he was five years old, so he had the, his father had, had a uh, very, very smart 
the young man that was older than he learned with him. And so the father of Yoshebar asked the young man that was learning with Chaim, he said, who knows how to learn better, you or Chaim? So the man answered him and he said, listen, Rebbe, if I tell you I know that I didn't learn better, it sounds like I'm a braggart, it sounds like I'm arrogant. But if I tell you that Chaim knows better, I'm a liar. <laughs> so his father turned to Chaim and said, well, what do you say? So he said, I said he is both. He's a braggart and a liar. <laughs> <clears throat> that typifies them. So he's not willing to give in. And he's only 15 years old. And he has nowhere to go. But he weathers the storm, because they find out the true story, and the Rosh Yeshiva came to apologize to him for suspecting that. Uh, and he continues on his way. Now, in Europe, when you were 15 years old, they looked for a shidduch for you already. Life was very short. The lifespan, the average lifespan was in the 30s. And, uh, you know, you couldn't wait till you finished and all of this stuff. So uh, there was a very wealthy Jew uh, that heard about <coughs> this genius. And so he wanted him for his daughter. It, not because, he, he, he didn't want him because of Rabbi Soloveitchik. He wanted him because of himself. He wanted to be able to say to all of his cronies, you know, look what a... There's a famous uh, joke that was told in the yeshivas that's not so funny, that a uh, man came to the Rosh Yeshiva and he said, uh, I want the best boy in the yeshiva. <clears throat> and so uh, he said, well, I got four or five. He interviews all of them and everything, and everybody goes through the motions, and then he says, okay, I'll take this one. So the Rishi Shiva says, okay, now tell me about your daughter. He says, I don't have a daughter. <laughs> so he says, if you don't have a daughter, then well, he said, listen, I have everything else in the world. Let me have a son-in-law that's running around too. You know, like. <laughs> so people need it for themselves. And uh, this is a shidduch that uh, uh, <clears throat> he offered him a lot of money in terms that he would be able to sit and learn for many years. He only saw the girl once, and they got married. Again, he is not, uh, you know, a son-in-law that a father-in-law can deal with. <laughs> He's the type of son-in-law that should be in Australia, and you're in New York, and then everything will be fine. But if he's living in your house, which was the way it worked, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. Again, because he gave no quarter to anyone. And uh, the, his brothers-in-law who were in the house uh, resented him because they felt that he got, uh, he got money for, uh, under false pretenses. And therefore, they kept on talking to their sister and to the father that he really is not a Talmud Chacham, he really is not a genius, he fooled you, the rabbis fooled you. And since the father had no idea as to how to measure who a person was, that a scholar or not a scholar, and after a while he believed him. And the father, in his stubbornness, forced him to divorce her after they had had a child, after they had a daughter, and uh, he, uh, he was broken by it, as you can imagine. But that was the arrogance of the wealthy, that they didn't even care about their own children. And he never really had anything to do with that daughter because they kept him away from her. So now what does he do? And he's still very young. So he comes back to Valozhin. 
Now, in Volozhin, the, uh, the, uh, the system was that there were two uh, Russia yeshiva at the same time, but that one was the Rosh Yeshiva, and the other one was his alternate that taught the, the shiurim. So they, uh, they would alternate, uh, uh, and they said the shiurim six times a week, and one said three times, one said twice, and then the sixth time they reviewed. And uh, the main Rosh Yeshiva was the one that took care of admissions, and he took care of tuition, uh, such as it was, and he took care of the funds, he ran the yeshiva. But the Mishnah, the, the assistant Rosh Yeshiva, was a very important job, and to a certain extent he always had more time to deal with the students than the Rosh Yeshiva, because the Rosh Yeshiva has all the other problems on his head, and his problem is only to say the shir. And uh, because of his familial connection, that he was a direct descendant from, the, from Reb Chaim Valozhiner, and because of his genius, uh, so they appointed him to be the second Rosh Yeshiva there. Now, when Reb Yitzhak Valozhiner died, so he had two sons-in-law. He had no sons that were that could be considered to take over the fathers. He had, he had a son, but, his, but the, uh, the Yeshiva and Valozhin had a board of Rabonim and Balabatim, and they were the ones that decided the matter. So they decided that his son was not in the running, and they took his oldest son-in-law, Abelezer Freed, to be the Rosh Yeshiva. Second in the second uh, Rosh Yeshiva was the other son-in-law, Reb Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Nitziv. Uh, the Nitziv also is a story of unappreciated genius. Uh, no one saw his greatness, and then all of a sudden his wonderful books came out, his commentary to the Sifrei, and his uh, commentary to the Shiltus Reb Achoigon, which made, for him, which made him world famous. And he was a, uh, his method of learning was simple, direct, uncomplicated, which basically was the traditional method of learning of Aloja. So you had Rebbe Lezer Fried as the Rosh Yeshiva, and the Mishneu, the second one, is the Nitziv. Now, Rabbi Lozer Fried was the second one when his father-in-law, Rabbi Yitzchok Valozhiner, was the first one. I hope it's not too confusing. Rabbi Lozer Fried dies within a year of his father-in-law. So the yeshiva, again, is without a head. Now, the question is, who should become the head? So... Logically, the Nitziv should automatically have become the head. The second one becomes the first one. But here also you have a case of family intrigues. Many, many people contested it. The Nitziv, all of his career, had many, many opponents who uh, attempted to undermine his stature and his place in the yeshiva. And uh, the Nitziv is finally appointed. There was a split off. One of the relatives made his own yeshiva in Valozhin, which is always the answer to everything. But that failed. And the Nitziv becomes the head, and they appoint Rabbi Yosheber Salavechik to be the second one. Now, he not only is a genius, he has his own way of learning. And his way of learning is deeply analytical. It's very, very sharp. It attracts the best minds. It's an excitement. And the Nitzivs is uh, placid. It's meat and potatoes. And he is, uh, is his dessert. And therefore, he attracts a great following in the yeshiva. 
and sometimes it's not good to be too good because that also causes problems. Now, so there was the, <coughs> there were, uh, <coughs> when it came to admitting a student in Valozhin, everybody wanted to come to Valozhin. It was the only game in town. Anybody had a good mind, that was where you had to go. You couldn't go to university because that meant converting to Christianity. That's why you had so many people who later were secular that came out of the yeshiva. Because there was nowhere else to go. And it was a place of genius and a place of study, 16, 18 hours a day, everybody. I remember my uh, grandfather, a blessed memory, who studied in Valozhin, said that the first uh, semester that he was in Valozhin from Sukkot to Purim, they learned Gitan and Kedushin Be'iyun. Two Masechtas finished completely in depth. And today, you know, if we do 25 pages in the, in the year, wow. So in any event, uh, the exclusive right to admit students belonged to the first Rosh Yeshiva, belonged to the Nitziv. And the Nitziv, uh, even though he admired people with great minds, was always wary of Iluyim, of geniuses. Because sometimes geniuses are, uh, are borderline uh, so he used to say, oh, Rabbi Yosha bears Iluyim, right? You know, he, yeah, he's not interested in them. And they had disputes as to admissions, who to take into the yeshiva, because the yeshiva had only a limited number of spaces. And then Siv always said he never had money to take students, the amount of students that wanted to come. So they had a, a convoluted system that... Uh, the town that gave the most money was entitled to send the most students. That was the admission system. So I remember that Mike Zeta told me that two years before he came to Valozhin, his family moved to the other town so he'd have a chance to get in. Because from his town, they didn't have any money. Buten, they didn't have any money. So there were no Butener, he said, in the yeshiva. But when he came, I forget which big town he came from. So, you know, so then he got in. And he starts saying shurim, but he wants to have a say in taking in students because he's looking for his type of student. And especially, there were many rabbonim in Lita who recognized the genius of Rabbi Yosheber and who underestimated the Nitziv. And therefore, they would write their letters of recommendation for the student, not to the Nitziv, but to Rabbi Yosheber, which was an insult. And Rabbi Yosheber now was not always sensitive to this. And therefore, he and the Nitziv many times disagreed on admissions, and they disagreed on the method of learning. Uh, they, they, uh, they didn't disagree personally on anything. But there were two different worlds, two different ideas on how the institution should look. Finally, what happened was that Rabbi Yosheber was so popular amongst a certain element of the students, his shiurim were of such a nature, and uh, they were so sharp and great, uh, that a revolution broke out amongst the students. Now, in the history of Lithuanian yeshivas, there were always revolutions against the establishment, the people who ran the yeshiva. That was part and parcel, that the students, you know, the inmates ran the asylum. They were the ones that were in charge. And uh, if they didn't like something, so they didn't like it. So one day the Nitziv came, so there was this incident where Rabbi Yosheber wanted to take the student in, and the Nitziv vetoed it, 
And Rabbi Yosha Ber was very sad about it, though he never said anything publicly, but the students found out about it. So the next day when the Nitziv came to say the shir, to give the lecture in the yeshiva, they didn't let him. They shouted him down. It was called a hopke. He used to throw down the shtenders. It was a rough place, the yeshivas. It still is. It's not, a, it's not the sea of tranquility. So people are surprised. This and this yeshiva, this happens. You know, it's all happened before. And if you uh, know the Talmud well, you'll see it happen in time of the Talmud also because human nature does not change. And uh, there's a rebellion, an absolute rebellion in the yeshiva. And it takes days to quiet it down. And the Nitziv and Rabbi Yosheber meet, and they say the yeshiva is going to be destroyed by this. So we have to settle it. How can we settle it? So they have a Din Torah. Now they had had a Din Torah before regarding the Nitziv, where Rabbi Yosheber backed the Nitziv against the cousins who wanted to undermine him. So, but that Din Torah was settled by two of the students of Rabbi Chaim Valozhin, or Rabbi David Tevel Minsker, and Rabbi Yosef Feimer. Now, they were now the, now the, now the Din Torah is between Rabbi Yosheber and the Nitziv. Who, whose yeshiva is it? And so they had four great Rabbonim that came, two of the two that came before, plus Rabbi Yitzchel Chonin Specter, who was then the Rav in Avaradok, and Rabbi Zev Wolf, that was the Magid in Vilna. These four came. They came on a Thursday. They said Shiurim, and it was Parshas Vayeshev. So the Magid said his famous drosha that's known in, in the yeshiva world. He said, until now in Chumash Breshis, every Parsha has a villain and a hero, right? You have Odom and the snake, or Cain and Hevel, and then you have Noach and the Dora Mabel, you have Avram and Lot, you have uh, Yitzchok and Yishmoel, you have Esau and Yaakov. So it's clear, right, who's right and who's wrong. He says, you come to the Parsha of Ayeshev, it's Yosef and the brothers. So it's no clear hero here anymore. They're both right. And they're all tzaddikim. So what do you decide? So he said, usually when we go to Din Torah, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. He says, here we're coming by the Nitziv and Rabbi Yosheber, you know, so they're both tzaddikim. How are we going to decide? But the end of the matter is that they did decide, and they decided in favor of the Nitziv. They gave him, uh, they gave the Nitziv the larger salary. Uh, they gave uh, him the exclusive right to take students. They gave him control of the yeshiva. And uh, Rabbi Yosheber also got an increase in salary. They made, they were absolutely destitute. By this time, he had remarried a second time, and he had a family already. And uh, he, uh, after this happens, uh, he realizes that he can't stay there in Valosian under those circumstances, because it'll only happen again. You'll come another, you know, next year's crop of students, and it'll repeat itself. So therefore, he gives up his position. And uh, the irony of all ironies is going to be that his son, Reb Chaim, is eventually going to take his position. And Reb Chaim is eventually going to be a, a grandson-in-law of the Nitziv, and that the whole family becomes one. And Reb Chaim runs a different yeshiva than the Nitziv, right? But the Nitziv this time let it happen. But now he leaves, and he has nowhere to go. And he has no, uh, no means of, 
uh, supporting his family. Now, he had always taken a commitment to himself that he would not be a rabbi of a community because being a rabbi of a community, uh, especially in 19th century Lithuania, was fraught with peril because the communities were run, as I mentioned, by a handful of very wealthy people and the communities were beset by enormous problems. Uh, the Russian government had passed all sorts of decrees against the Jewish community. They had to supply young men for the army. So this upper class decided who would go to the army. Their children never went. The rabbi's child never went. The shochet's child never went. Who went? The shoemaker, the balagola, the widow, their children went. And you hear an echo of it today. People don't understand it. When they talk about the army and going to the army or not going to the army, they're not just talking about today's army. That's an echo of 200 years ago. That I should, my child should go to the army and yours not. And the Rov has to sit on this uh, volcano. Taxes. So the rich have always a way of avoiding taxes. The poor schnook pays them. They take it out of his check. Goodbye. So he knew that he's in for a very rough ride, but he had no other way to live. He had nothing he could do. And there was a great opportunity in one of the leading Lithuanian communities, Slutsk, that had great Rabonim. Rabbi Yosef Feimer was the Rav there before him, and he was a uh, great Gon and Tzaddik. He had a son, Mayor Feimer, who lived in Slutsk, and who the Balabatim wanted to take him to be the Rav, to succeed his father. But Reb Meir was such a tzaddik, he said, take me when you have Reb Yosheber Salavechik available. He said, what are you guys, out of your mind? And he refused to take the position, and he is the one that really pushed Reb Yosheber into the position. Reb Yosheber is the Rav in Slutsk for ten and a half years. There isn't a day without controversy. The first Shabbos that he comes to shul, he sees that the children come to school dressed in their school uniform. And we're talking here 1850, 1858. We're not talking, you know, 20th century. They're dressed in the school uniform of the local gymnasium. And they've got the school books in the backpack on their shoulders. They come to shul, and right after Kriyos Torah, they all get up and they're going to school on Shabbos. And these are the children of the wealthy. These are the children of the, because they could afford it. So the father is sitting in the, in the, the eastern wall of the base medrash with the talus over his head. And his kid is going to school on Shabbos. So his first drosha, which set the tone was that he told them, how can you do such a thing? How can you let your children go to the... He said, you can't let them go to the gymnasium on Tuesday. It's trafe. Which it was. But he said, on Shabbos? Well, that didn't make a big hit. Because the uh, wealthy people in town told, told them, listen, what we do with our children is our business, Rabbi. Rabbi, you talk about Judaism. Don't mix into our business. Rabbi Yosheber can't, can't stay out of it. Uh, he uh, immediately takes up the cause of the poor people in town. He gets a list of every person in town, every family, how many people are in the family. And he, and, uh, he makes a reckoning of how much each family lives, uh, needs to live. And he forces the charity institutions of the community to distribute money according to his list. 
And they say, Rabbi, that's none of your business. We've got charity institutions, we've got Gaboyim, we collect the money, we know who to distribute it, a lot of people are fakers. We stay out of it. You sit and learn. And not him. Smash in the face. And therefore, you can imagine uh, that it has... Uh, A great deal of tension. A great deal of tension. What happens is that about 40 of his former students from Valozhin come to him and they say, you know, Valozhin is dry as toast. And the Nitziv is there. The second one that they appointed is also he's not doing it. And the Nitziv appointed eventually his son-in-law, Rabbi Foyal Shapiro, You make your own yeshiva here in Slutsk. We'll come, we're, we're 40, we'll bring you another 100 students, you'll have the biggest yeshiva here. Rebbe, make the yeshiva. Not only that, the Balabatim in Slutsk, who uh, want to make a big name for Slutsk, all of a sudden come to him and say, we heard your students want to make a yeshiva, we'll support it. You won't have to raise a nickel because they're interested in their honor to be able to say that, you know, he's the president of Slutsk and Slutsk has the biggest yeshiva. And Rabbi Yoshebeer told them, gentlemen, no, I will not do anything to harm the yeshiva in Valozhin. I will not take away one student. If he comes here, I will send him back. I will not accept one penny, but since you're so interested in supporting Torah, Slutsk is going to double its quota of money that it's going to send to Valozhin. Well, they didn't like that. That isn't what they had in mind. And uh, he, uh, he wrote many letters in which he expressed his pain because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted nothing more to have a yeshiva, and he would say shurim and Torah. I mean, that was him. And not be bothered with, you know, with the, with the, with the shochet and with the butcher and with the, with the bakery and, and, and all of the squabbles that exist uh, that any rov has to face. He literally called it uh, olam hashtuyot. That was his definition of the rabbinate. All nonsense. Well, he stayed ten and a half years, but uh, it uh, wasn't pleasant. And then finally, there was one incident that ended it completely. There was a very, very wealthy Jew in town who was the uh, wealthiest Jew in town. And uh, who on the surface was a miser, never gave to any charity, never gave to anything in the community, nothing. He had had a very difficult childhood, he had, was abused, uh, he was a self-made man, he ended up being the chief furniture maker for the Russian government, and he was very wealthy, and everybody was afraid of him. He was a dour personality. And once there was a case of a widow that needed an enormous amount of money and the town simply didn't have it. And so and Rabbi Yoshebeer is the one that always took the lead in raising money for the poor. And he gave away half his salary at least on a regular basis to the poor. There were times that he gave away his wife's candlesticks. He said, we can light candles, you know, put it in, put it in the dirt. It's also your Yotze uh, Nehru Shabbos. So uh, he said, I'm going to see this guy. I, mean, I have his name, but why should I say his name? By the way, there's a marvelous book on Rabbi Yosheber called Horishon L'Shoshelet Brisk by Rabbi Chaim Karlinsky, Zichrona Lavrocha who's a member of the Beis Arav, 
and who wrote this marvelous book in which she really characterizes him. Until now, it has escaped the eyes of... Anyway, so... Uh, he finds him in the... Every day, this Jew would go to the base Medrash and say the entire book of Tehillim. So he goes to Shul and he finds him saying Tehillim. This is a man that never gave, he didn't give for Moses, he didn't give for the Hever Kadisha, he didn't give for anything. And Rabbi Yosheber comes to him and he says, I want you to give me, I don't know, a thousand ruble, whatever, some outlandish amount. Now the man had all of his life given secretly money to the Rav in town, to the previous Rav, to Rabbi Yosef Feimer, and later to his son, Rabbi Meir Feimer. And so that, in essence, he was a charitable man. But his, he despised the community leaders who had abused him when he was poor. And therefore, he didn't join, he didn't give them anything. And so Rabbi Yosheber says to him, I want this amount of money, we need it for the widow, etc. So he says, Rabbi, forget it. I'm in the middle of Tehillim, why you interrupt me? So Rabbi Yosheber told him the famous example. He said, you know, uh, you're a traitor. You're a deserter. So he said, what are you talking about? He said, well, in the army, you know that uh, there are people in the infantry and people in the artillery and people in the cavalry. If people in the cavalry decide that they're going to be in the artillery, the army's going to lose. He said, I have plenty of people to say to heal him. I don't have people to give a thousand ruble. God gave you the money, you have to give it to me. And uh, there was a great enmity that arose between them. And uh, he uh, caused, caused him untold troubles. Until after ten and a half years of it, uh, he, uh, he decided he had enough. Then, unfortunately, his second wife died. And he's left uh, bereft, alone, in a sea of enemies. So he decides he's leaving the rabbinate and he's leaving Slutsk. And he travels to Warsaw. Now, Warsaw is the seat of Hasidus especially of the Ger, the Chedush Rim is there. And here's this Lithuanian rabbi. He made such an impression in Warsaw, they wanted to elect him to be the rabbi of Warsaw. But the uh, Russian governor uh, vetoed it because of a story that I'll tell you in a minute, that Rabbi Soloveitchik was on the bad list of the Russians. So he couldn't become the rabbi in Warsaw. In Brisk, the rabbi was Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin, the famous Maril Diskin, who later came here to Yerushalayim. Uh, Rabbi Yosheber held that the Maril Diskin was the great man of the generation, the greatest man in Torah, the greatest personality. A strange story happens with the Maril Diskin. There's a woman in Brisk that her husband deserted her and converted to Christianity. The woman was a young woman, so she wanted him to give her a divorce, a get. He said he won't do it unless he has 1,800 ruble, which is an enormous sum of money. The Rebetzin, Rebetzin Diskin, uh, threw herself into the project and uh, she raised uh, 1,400 ruble. And the money was entrusted to the rabbi, to the Maril Diskin. And uh, the Rebetzin uh, spoke to this uh, husband and said, I have all the money for you. You can come and give the get. So he thought all the money was 1,800 ruble. He comes and he gives her the get. What she does then, she does, she's missing 400 rubles and she has nowhere to get it. So what she does is concoct the story. She says, a Ganev came into the town 
and stole 400 rubles from her husband's desk. She only has 1,400. And she gives him the 1,400. To make the story more legitimate, she files a police report. The guy takes the 1,400 ruble, and he's happy. He's got 1,400 at least. And then he thinks about it for a few days. He said, why would the guy leave the 1,400? <laughs> and he starts to smell that the story. And then he finds out that the day after the get was given, she withdrew the police report. So he goes to the Russian authorities, who are always looking to arrest rabbis. And they accused them of the whole plot. And the Maril Diskin absolutely knew nothing about it. His wife did it. And he's arrested and taken to jail in Grodna. And they want to send him to Siberia for, uh, for 10 years. And Rabbi Yoshebert turns over heaven and earth to get him out. Every possible uh, influence, bribery, they raised a fortune, tens of thousands of rubles to pay off people. And eventually he's freed, but his, uh, his uh, lawyer told him, they hired the best defense lawyer in Russia, told him that he should leave the country immediately because they'll arrest him again. And that's how he comes there to Israel. That's how he comes to Yerushalayim. So now Brisk has no rabbi. And the people of Brisk come to Rabbi Yosheber that he should be the Rav in Brisk. And he turns them down. He says, they'll say I'm part of this conspiracy, right? I got rid of the old rabbi, right? I got him out of jail and sent him to Israel so I can sit on his seat. But all the rabbis in Lithuania write to him and say that he has to assume it, this position. Now, Brisk is one of, much greater than Slutsk in population and prestige. It's one of the great positions. And he uh, comes to Brisk. And since his reputation preceded him, uh, the Balabatim, so to speak, behaved themselves better because they knew what they were getting. And he makes a name for himself in his charitable work and helping the poor. Foundlings were left at his door that he raised. All of this his son, Reb Chaim, also did when Reb Chaim uh, succeeded him as being the Rav and Brisk. And uh, <clears throat> He and the Nitziv, he, the Nitziv came to be Menachem Ovalim when his wife died, paid him a shiva visit, and at the shiva visit they made a shidduch, because the aloch is that a shidduch supersedes everything. And they made a shidduch with Reb Chaim Salavechik, Reb Yosheb Be'er's son, with the granddaughter of the Nitziv, Reb Foyle Shapiro's daughter. And that's how the family came together completely. And uh, the children were born from that marriage as well. He had children from all of his marriages. And in Brisk, he is, uh, after Rabbi Hanan, he's the chief rabbi of Lithuania. To such an extent, when New York City was looking to take a chief rabbi, and eventually they took Rabbi Yaakov Yosef. They wanted to take Rabbi Yosheber Salavechik to come to be the rabbi in New York. So they were a few generations ahead of themselves because his grandson, Rabbi Meshe Salavechik, came and his great-grandson, his namesake, Rabbi Yosheber Salavechik, came. But he didn't come. And he, together with the Nitziv, uh, supported the Chovev Eitzion, the movement to send Jews to Eretz Yisrael. And, but he, together with the Nitziv, were the main opponents of the Heter Mechira of Shemitah, which uh, in 1882 and 1889 uh, split the rabbinic world. And until today, it remains that way. He was a bitter opponent of the Haskalah. He said, they'll destroy us. 
on the surface, it looks like their ideas are good, and, but he said it'll destroy the Jewish people. He was not far off. Uh, he was a... Uh, he, uh, he said that anything in Eretz Yisrael has to have the approval of Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. And since Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin opposed the Heter Mechira, so therefore he said we could not support it. Uh, the Haskola, the Maskilim, because of his firm opposition to them, painted him in very, very dark colors. Uh, they besmirched him in their newspapers, etc. You know, they portrayed him as being an extremist, as a, uh, you know, a person, that, as they called it, a person of the darkness that doesn't want to let them open the windows to let light into the Jewish world. Uh, but he, uh, as, as we can imagine, he gave them no quarter either. He would not compromise on it. And he wrote three great books, uh, three volumes, the Beis Alevi, which established his reputation until today. It's used in all the yeshivas as a tremendously deep analytical uh, perspective on Talmud and on the issues there. And he also wrote a book on the, the Parshas of the week, Abrashis and Shmos, and he himself uh, published them. And uh, it, was, it really made his uh, reputation to be uh, uh, as, a, uh, as the chief man, right? And uh, the, uh, his son, Reb Chaim, became the second to the Nitziv in Valozhin. So that he took over his father's place. And Reb Chaim created his own new method of analysis, of study, which captured the yeshiva world completely. And that much of what it is today, they call it brisker Torah. Torah from Reb Chaim or Brisk. Uh, this method of dealing with it. And uh, I remember my Zayda told my Zayda had smicha from Reb Chaim in the Nitziv. So he said that the yeshiva was always divided in half. Half of them uh, appreciated the Nitziv and half of them appreciated Reb Chaim. But that, uh, but that since he was the grandfather so that they lived together very well and they didn't have any uh, problems and the yeshiva remained whole. At the end of his life, uh, uh, he uh, had various ailments. It was, uh, and in those days, uh, the ailments uh, didn't, it was very difficult to prolong a person's life. So when he died, the thing that broke his heart was that in 1891, the Russian government, 1891-92, Russian government closed the yeshiva in Valozhin. They demanded that the yeshiva adopt the schedule. Uh, the yeshiva could only be open from 9 to 6, and that uh, from 9 to 3 they had to teach secular studies, and you could only teach uh, from 3 to 6 Torah, all sorts of conditions which nobody could accept. And the Russian police came one morning and closed the yeshiva. And the yeshiva disbanded. The Nitziv himself went to Warsaw. He was on the way to come to Eretz Yisrael. He suffered a stroke. He died in Warsaw, and he's buried in Warsaw. Reb Chaim Salavechi was buried next to him. There's a big OL there for the two graves. Reb Chaim also died in Warsaw. And he died in Brisk. And when he, had, at the end of the yeshiva, they all announced that his son, Reb Chaim, should come and take over to be the Rav in Brisk. Reb Chaim was the Rav in Brisk. When Reb Chaim died, so Reb Chaim had three sons. So Reb Moshe was in, was in New York, and Reb Velvela, Reb Yitzhak Zev, became the Rav in Brisk. He was, in, he was called here in Israel the Brisker Rav.